in my defense, there are two Revelation song references on the thing, and I thought that that was that one we sang before was the one. So it's really Larry's fault for. Yes, yes, I am not responsible for my own actions. No. And you covered my sermon pretty well with all those songs, so hopefully I've got some more to say other than all of the things we just sang. But we are going to be in Revelation this morning, <clears throat> and really just chapter one. Uh, this is not an eschatology type of study, uh, though there are some truly amazing things to get into uh, in the book of Revelation. It's an intimidating book, but it is also a fantastic book to study from, even if you have no clue about anything that's going on. If you're just reading from chapter one to the end, and I mean, it, for, first time I ran through it, it, was, it, you don't understand anything except the actual words you're reading. I mean, you know those words, but there are even parts of that where you're like, I don't know what that word really means. So Revelation is great. It's just a great read. Uh, whether it's your first time or your 20th time or whatever it may be, there's always something to discover and, and it blesses you. And in fact, that is a part of Revelation. God says this is a blessing to those who hear these words and, and, and speak these words and study. And I think it extends far, far more than that. I think it affects your life uh, in, in an impactful way. And I, that's why I want to get into it because the part of Revelation, even though I love the eschatology of it, the part of Revelation that I love is what Revelation is really about. Uh, and we're going to get into that. So I was scheduled to be after Ron. We've had uh, some sicknesses and illnesses and the, and the elders and teachers and song teams and everything have been very generous to shift things around. So this message was to be piggybacked after Ron's message. With, Ron didn't know that, but I, this, I wanted to look, take a look more at who Jesus is, what the Bible says Jesus is, what he claimed to be, because there are claims he makes of himself in Revelation, and sometimes Revelation does not get credited as to the argument that people say Jesus never said this or that. And we'll look at those things. That's the whole point of this message this morning. We're going to look at also a little bit of John, because John is the one who writes this, and as humble as John is, he has to put his name in there uh, because God dealt with John. And I think what an incredible ministry John had, but what an incredible experience uh, that John had because he was one of the few in the, an inner circle that got to see things the rest did not get to see. Uh, so he, he has gotten to see Jesus in a way twice now that perhaps no one else has gotten to see unless you have read Revelation. So this is not, not entirely like Acts is to Luke, but Revelation is kind of a continuance of what John had to write in, John, in the Gospel of John. So we have kind of a John part two in Revelation, but there's, there's more to it than that. And I believe <clears throat> Revelation 1.8 is, is kind of the hinge pin of everything that I want to talk about today. But I think it's the hinge pin, a hinge pin of the entire book of Revelation. And we often miss it when we get into the seals and then the bowls and then the vials and we get all this destruction and a third of this is being destroyed and a third of this is being destroyed and there's plagues and there's creatures that climb out of the, uh, some hole somewhere and it's, they're stabbing people with their, you know, it, it gets crazy. But don't miss what that's supposed to show us about who Jesus is. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That is such a loaded verse all by itself. What a loaded verse. Because you really have to look at every single little aspect to see that there is an impact in how we view Jesus just in, the, in this one verse, let alone all the verses we're going to look at. Who is Jesus? Well, we see in verse 18, it's kind of a spoiler, but we've already, we've read it, uh, we've seen it, we've sung it. So uh, Jesus says, I, the, who is dead and is alive? right? Who is dead and who is alive? Jesus is the only one that can claim that purposefully like that. There are people who have died and have been raised, but that was 
a different circumstance and we don't accredit deity or these things to those people. Jesus raised them. We see this as Jesus. Okay, so I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, says the Lord. And that little Lord there we're going to talk about because that's very important also, I think, is one of the neat things that I like to uh, discover, rediscover, continually study because it uh, how the Bible handles some of these terms. Sometimes people say, well, you're nitpicking, but then at the same time, you kind of have to to really understand what's happening here. And if you don't, you kind of miss some of the beauty that's happening here. We'll get into that. <clears throat> Excuse me. The scope of today's uh, study, and I've already mentioned this, but it's not going to be to decipher or, or dig into or make sense of eschatology. Though, again, please do, because there is, uh, there's, even if you don't get it by the end of the day, there's, it, still, it still blesses you, it still moves you, it still changes you. It's God's word that is washing you in some way. Firstly, we're going to look at who wrote Revelation. Let's read Revelation 1, 1 through 2, and if you just want to keep your thumb, if you've got a Bible, just keep your thumb in, in Revelation 1, because we're going to re reference that, obviously, through the whole thing. I'm going to skip around, too. I'm not going to cover absolutely every single verse. Revelation 1, 1 through 2 reads, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must, must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. A lot of prepositions in there. So it kind of makes it unclear sometimes as to what, what we're actually reading. But the reason why I'm I, I want to avoid the eschatology, not because of the difficulty of it, but, but because even in this verse alone, there's already several things that it shows that we have to deal with uh, that uh, impacts how we view the eschatology events in the rest of the book of Revelation. Things like shortly take place is a tough one uh, to manage. Uh, he sent and signified it is an interesting study in and of itself. We are going to look at specifically the revelation of Jesus Christ and who wrote Revelation. Who was blessed to write such an amazing book? And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John, this John that is, is uh, mentioned here is one who witnessed Jesus Christ. Well, I think it's easy to connect, in my opinion, that this is the John of, the Gospel of John as well, who wrote those and wrote the three epistles and was one who was beloved by Jesus and got to be in that inner circle. There's always a contest against these ideas. There's, al there's always someone who's got a different opinion, but for the most part, every people agree with this for the most part, I say. But John, <clears throat> John had more than just uh, witnessed Jesus' ministry. Like I said, he got to be a part of specific things that only a couple others got to be a part of as well. We see in Mark 9, verse 2 through 3, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, there's those three, and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can uh, whiten them. Mark makes that special mention. I think that's neat because it's a description that is almost awkward in a way, but it's like he wanted to make it a point. It was whiter than any man could have made it. It was so white and, and luminous that it was there was no way this was something of man. It only could be of God. Mark makes that special mention. But who is in this experience? John. John got to see Jesus before John got to write Revelation as this figure, whether this was to represent Jesus in the future or just his glory that he stepped down from or whatever it may be. John got to see something that was outside of his comprehension, outside of time perhaps, outside of, of anything that he knew up to that point. Because though he may have believed who Jesus was, he didn't really get to see who Jesus was until this point. 
And then John has, again, that, the, this incredible experience in Revelation, and he gets to write all these things down and expound upon what he sees here. Now, I don't know that this is when Revelation was given to him. He, he says that he was given it later. Um, but it's obviously an extension of what he saw here because we see this imagery again in his own terms as we go through Revelation 1. <clears throat> so John was witness to Jesus' ministry, uh, but he was also witness to Jesus' glory in, real, in, in a real sense. Okay, now keep in your minds uh, the image of what John saw here because it will come up again later and I will share a different, from a different gospel this same experience in a different way. We get a glimpse of what he explains in Revelation through this. Uh, we come to verse 1 <clears throat> in Revelation. Who is the revelation of Jesus Christ? So we're not talking about necessarily the eschatology of things, even though that's, that is what that Revelation is also about. We are talking about Jesus Christ and, we, and the, what the writer and the, and the purpose of the book of Revelation is to discover something about Jesus Christ. So sometimes it's difficult because we, we, we think of things the way we already know them to be, but this is still something that was being defended, and it's still being defended today. We have many different ideologies and, and faiths and religions, even within Christendom, if you will, who we still have to defend who Jesus is as the Christ and as God. And that's, that's, that's still a thing we wrestle with today, but that was definitely a thing back then because they was still defending who Jesus was to those who were followers. So in this context, uh, the showing and really working out who Jesus was was very important in that first century, if you will. They hadn't totally established that yet. There's still people who had even experienced Jesus in their life were still probably thinking, I don't know who, I don't know what I just witnessed. I don't know what I just saw. But there were certainly people who were following Christ being persecuted who need to be built up just as we do today in seeing who Christ is and being encouraged by uh, the imagery and things that John had got to witness. Now he wants to share what God has given him. An interesting thing about that is God gave him Jesus and then Jesus gave it. So Jesus is revealing himself. So it is more complicated than just John wrote it. John was given it, and it's almost a special means by which he receives it and is giving it. This word, though, for revelation uh, is, and I always butcher it, and I've been practicing it, and I'm not going to say it again, but it's the way I've always said it is apocalypsis. That's not how you pronounce it in Greek. It's apocalypsis, it's like apocalypsis or something like that. But anyway, all you other Greek people snickering on the deep, you know, deep inside, that's fine. I'll take that. Apocalypsis is the Greek word. You can hear it already. What is that word in our English? Apocalypse, right? But what do we think of when we think of apocalypse? We think of explosions and end times. And this is, there's some, some major cataclysmic event that has occurred, of, like a virus, not to be put a to point, find a point on it, but the, that's what we always think of. The apocalypse is that, that ending moment or some big moment that changes human history forever more than just uh, the stock market crashes, though that could cause an apocalypse for sure. But it's not just a downfall. They, they believed that the apocalypse was occurring with World War I, with World War II, with wars that have happened before, with the Black Plague, with uh, different things in history that have come and gone. But what apocalypse actually means is entirely different than the end of the world, even though Revelation is dealing with the, the end of the things that we see them as today. But it's really marking the beginning of something that God is going to do for all eternity, which is the beautiful thing. So we come to it. Apocalypsis in Greek really means laying bare, making naked, a disclosure of truth, or instruction concerning things before unknown, used of events by which things or states or persons hitherto withdrawn from view are made visible to all. Sounds like I'm reading a contract when I say things like hitherto. 
the, so then I don't want to read it because I don't want to, I don't know. I get confused with all those. A manifestation or appearance, which is also you see in Revelation, this appearance of Jesus Christ. But we are, what, what we are reading here in Revelation is a revealing of Jesus Christ and all his glory and then all that that means. And, and I, I believe that as we study Revelation, that's one reason why we can't totally grasp it all. We get bits and pieces and we build on that and we come back and we learn a little more and we get a little more because that's just how complicated and how big and glorious Jesus Christ is. We look at, we look at these terms that we're going to look at today. And again, I've come back to this many times. I've spoken about this many times. Other teachers have spoken about this. You can read about this. We've done it in a study hall or uh, in uh, Sunday school. You start to see Jesus as God, but Jesus as separate from God the Father, and I don't comprehend that, but it, it, it is. It goes together. It smashes together somehow, but it's so much more complicated than I can really wrap my brain around. Maybe complicated isn't the term, because I, under, I, I get it. I don't, I don't disbelieve it. It's just a level of... of Maybe it's some dimensional thing that I just can't grasp. Uh, maybe it's some, you know, some cosmic thing, some quantum physics thing that is just outside my ability to really, to really grab. Um, but it's a revealing of Jesus Christ and who He is, and and amazingly, that's why I made the comment about there are pe there were people at this time, people still today that that did not see Jesus as God, and I think it's interesting that part of that revealing that we see is a strong uh, defense of Jesus as God in this first chapter as well, especially. Okay, so we have revealing. Who's doing the revealing? Jesus is doing the revealing. God gave it to Jesus to reveal. Jesus gave it to, in some way, that's another thing to discuss, but we won't get into that. Jesus gave it through a messenger to John to write down. That's what we have. So John writes it down. <clears throat> John also uh, obviously writes John, well maybe not obviously, but I believe John wrote the Gospel of John and there are some interesting things that are that are hinted at even in John's Gospel. John writes this of Jesus making this comment of himself, I am one who bears witness of myself and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. The Holy Spirit will bear witness of Jesus when the Holy Spirit comes, and then now we have all three. All one, all in union, all agreeing, but three distinct. Again, how? I don't know. But I believe it, and the Bible lays it out very clearly. There's no, I don't believe that the argument is really valid against what who Jesus is. There is an argument about trying to understand how that all works, absolutely. John writes also, this is one of the things that Ron uh, brought up and is one of those common uh, verses when you, if you get into uh, any kind of defense of the Bible against false religions or occultism or anything like that, this is one of those where people say, Jesus never said that he was God. Right here he does. In the Gospel of John, at least. Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I am. And read what happens after that, and you'll see that they understood what he was saying, right? Revelation's opening sets the focus, the focus on the whole of the book and everything that follows. It is about Jesus. It's about Jesus the Christ, his glory, what he is doing, what he is accomplishing. Beautiful, beautiful passages. Re uh, Revelation 5 is one of my favorite. Uh, I, maybe I talk about it too much, I don't know, but Revelation 5 is one of, is one of my favorites because it's, it's even more like this revealing of Jesus Christ and his now his ability to take hold of the things that were promised. But before that, John weeps because he, it seems hopeless and seems lost. Without Jesus and without this revelation, I believe as well, there is a sense of feeling lost because we don't have, if Jesus is not the first and the last, if he is not the Almighty, then there is definitely this sense of feeling well, some doubt. He promised me. He died for me. But if he is not all of those things as well, I don't know that I could truly have faith, 
truly have confidence in the promises that God has given me for eternity with him. But because Jesus is all and in all those things, it, it solidifies those promises, at least to me. It's a confidence builder when I read through these things because I see if he is the first and the last and the beginning of the end and he has died for me, then it is truly eternal. No one can take that away. No one can change that because they are not before Christ and they are not after Christ. They are not powerful enough to take it from him. This isn't a Thanos moment, right? This, is, this isn't anything like that. Jesus is above everything because he is God. So those promises can be believed with confidence. John also makes, it starts out the, very similarly, not exactly. Uh, in John, the Gospel of John starts off with defending Christ's deity. And this is a common uh, passage we have, we have seen before. This is not a new one. But again, just seeing the pattern of John writing, but also seeing this is important. It is important to identify Jesus as God. Because it, everything uh, that we have as promise is hinged upon, is rests upon this fact. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So he has authority over everything that was made. And it was purposeful through him. And then jumping down, it's not advancing, there we go. Jumping down to 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Dwelt being tabernacled. I like to say he tabernacled with us because there's a uh, direct reference to the Old Testament tabernacle and the, the, the purpose of all of that. But we've covered that before. And we behold his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. <clears throat> Let's go back to Revelation 1. If you will, I'm going to take a sip of water here. Which you can never do. I never feel comfortable doing that on camera. In front of people in general, but I definitely don't in front of the camera. But it is what it is. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're going to skip down to verse 7. So I'm, I am skipping a few verses here, but the, they are important, but not for the scope of what I'm doing. I want to, I want to cover these things specifically. Revelation 1, verse 7 through 8, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and they who pierced him. So the pers this person we're talking about has been pierced. And all of the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So the one who is saying this has been pierced, and is also claiming to be the Almighty. There's some wordplay in here that I really, really like. Uh, these are the fun things that I like. We'll look at them uh, properly uh, here in, in the next couple slides. But let's look at Lord and how it's used in the Old Testament and New. We're going to jump to Psalm 110. Again, it's a, this is a, a known verse, but it's a quoted verse often uh, two or three times in the New Testament at least. Uh, there may be more that I'm just forgetting, but it's, it is referenced and explained a couple different times in, in books like Acts and Hebrews. Psalm 110, a psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. We've got two lords in here. Which one is which, and who, who are we talking about? What's going on here, right? I will say, uh, at least in the King James, the New King James, I don't, I don't remember how they're dealt with in ESV and in ASB and other, other things, but if it is big capital letters, if anyone knows this, they can shout it out to me. If they are big capital letters, all big, all capital, what is that? Whose name is that? Yahweh, Jehovah, uh, the unpronounceable name of God or un unsaid name of God or uh, we're not supposed to say it's Y-H-W-H, yod hey vo hey all of those things. The tetragrammatron, I think, is what it's, is another term. All of those things, Jehovah, that's God's name, right? 
But who is the little Lord? And in, I think, the King James, it's all lower, all small capital letters, except for the L, that's big. What is the little Lord? Does anyone know? Without saying Jesus Christ, which we're getting to, does anyone know what the Hebrew word for that is? Ad, Adon, Adonai, right? We've heard that. We've sang songs, Adonai, I lift up my voice, okay, right? We know we're familiar with that. Maybe not if you are not. Uh, this is where we get that, Adonai. An interesting thing about this is in this verse alone, they have two names that they actually use. One, they're not supposed to say verbally. They can write it, right? But they don't say verbally is Yahweh or however it is actually because the we're kind of guessing at how you would actually say that tetragrammatron is is either that's why we have Yahweh or Jehovah because they are they could both be right they use Adonai in place of that in speaking terms so when they are reading the word of God out loud and they are saying coming up to saying the name of God they don't say the name of God they say Adonai well it's interesting because here we have Adonai in this verse. So what do they do with this? How do we handle this? What's going on here? Well, we have an explanation of this in Acts. Peter, who is Holy Spirit uh, possessed, so to speak, if you will, speaking these words, says this of Psalm 110 from Acts 2, 34 through 36. For David did not ascend into the heaven. He's questioning. He's asking. You know this verse. What is this verse actually saying? So he is explaining this verse. This is a commentary within the Bible. God explaining his own word here in Acts. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's important. What is Christ? Messiah, that's what they were expecting. What's Lord? Ah, well, that's interesting because that word, Jesus is Lord and Christ, that word Lord connects directly back to Psalm 110. How, Josh, does that work? <clears throat> well, I'm glad you asked. The word in Greek is kurios, kurios, and it means that's tr often translated Lord, but it can be translated Master. It can be translated in different terms like that. Paul uses kurios of Jesus Christ, my Lord Jesus Christ, or the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the term Paul uses. But <laughs> the term itself, like many terms, has its meaning in its context. It doesn't necessarily always mean Adonai. It is used just as Elo, uh, as, as El is, as Elohim is used. It can be used for people. It can be used for people of power. Uh, but it, when it's in context, a certain context, it is used of Jesus Christ, just as Paul uses it. We have the definition. This is from Strong's. All of these are from Strong's, if you want to double check me. To whom a person or thing belongs, master, a lord, a possessor and disposer of a thing, the owner, one who has control, in the state, the sovereign prince, chief emperor. So we see more of an earthly use of this word. B, a title of honor expressive of respect and reverence. So it might be if you are addressing, you know, if you're watching any uh, old English type of mo show, movies or shows and they're addressing a king, you call them Lord or call them different things. And you have to call specific, sometimes your grace is really more what you're supposed to say. But anyway, you get what I'm getting at. And uh, Strong's decides to uh, also commentate on what how Lord is used, which I, is is fine with me. But uh, the, it is used to in context with God and the Messiah. We see Jesus says, or P Peter says that Jesus is Lord and Messiah, but we haven't gotten to the connection with Lord Kyrios being God, but we're about to. The Greek Septuagint of Kyrios is, is the word that is used in Psalm 110. But the Hebrew word is Adon, which is where we get Adonai. So what is the name that is used here in uh, Psalm 110? It is Yahweh says to Adonai. 
sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And there are promises wrapped up in that that uh, identify who this person is. But I think just a basic understanding of what the wordplay that's going on is proof and evidence in and of itself. Adon means firm, strong, Lord, master. It is synonymous, if you will, with the Greek, it is Greek equivalent with Kyrios. They are synonymous with each other. Lord, master, reference to man, superintendent, master, king, reference to God, the Lord God, and they use this term in replace of when they speak. So remember that. And I just skipped B because it was very long and I wanted to fit it on the screen and it was, it was kind of redundant to A. But you can go back and look if you want. Uh, B is there. I, I did not accidentally label it C. <clears throat> my Lord, my Master, reference to man, Master, Prince, King, or reference to God, my Lord, Adonai. And it really is uh, used as more of a personal thing as well. Paul says, my Lord, Jesus Christ. It is, it is almost a, a, a passionate name for God, if you will. <clears throat> it is a, uh, a more uh, sentimental kind of name. Okay, so we have the Lord says to my Lord. Let's see who Lord is, capital L, capital R, capital O-R-D, all big, all of those things, the Yahweh, okay? Isaiah 44, 6 through 7 says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Well, now it seems to be layering more difficultly. My Redeemer, but we're using the Yahweh part of the name for Lord of hosts. Well, who's the Redeemer? I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. This sounds very familiar, does it not? And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people. And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. I think that is very impressive that we're that we see back in Isaiah almost this exact phrasing. I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Well, Jesus is when he when we get to Revelation. So what does that mean? Revelation 1 11, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Who is saying this? Well, like I've said before, we've already done a spoiler because First 18 says it, right? But I'm going to work it out anyway so that we can see it. Revelation 2.8 says this. Jesus is writing letters through John. He's telling John. He, John is, is taking dictation right to these churches. This is what I have to say. This is what he says. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. The first and the last is... Jehovah, but also died. So who are we talking about here? Jesus Christ. Both. Somehow, right? Both, but one. Because the Lord is one God. Okay. <clears throat> who was dead and is now alive? Amen to that. We're going to look at the title for the Almighty. God says this to Moses in Exodus, I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name is Lord. He says, my name, Lord. I was not known to them. What is that? Yahweh, Jehovah, Tetragrammatron, yah God, God, big God. But we're here we're reading that Jesus is the Almighty. Ezekiel 124 says, When they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult like the horse of an ar of the noise of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. This is a description. Ezekiel is fantastic as well with all of these descriptions. But here we have, uh, when I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters, like the voice. So they weren't hearing the voice necessarily. It was a description. But, the, but we're going to see this imagery as well in Revelation. He has this voice, like the Almighty. Okay, very good. 
<clears throat> okay, so we know the Almighty is Yahweh, Jehovah, whichever you prefer. <coughs> Excuse me. And we will see some more, like I mentioned, uh, the noise, the sounds of many waters, these kind of images start to flesh themselves out as we continue on. And we will just continue on. We will skip to our verse reading down to verse 12 through 14 for this first slide. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in them the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. That is some imagery, right? But this is not, uh, I think, in question about who we're talking about here. One like the Son of Man is used multiple times. Uh, we will get to that. But we're talking about a name that I think is common, that people understand who Jesus is, Son of God, Son of Man, songs about those things. Uh, if you've been in church long at all, you've heard that. People who have not been in church have heard that. That's one of the things that people like about Jesus is that he, if he is God, he's uh, or just a prophet, he is the son of man, like he is, you know, he is one of us. What if God were one of us? Okay. Sorry, I've lost my place. Here we go. All right, and we'll keep reading on. Verse 15, his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand and seven stars out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. We already saw an image uh, in Mark. John witnessed this countenance, this shining bright as the sun, this G Jesus being transfigured before him and seeing him as he in his glory. <clears throat> but we also have in Matthew... Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, this should, should read very similar, his brother, led him up on a high mountain, uh, mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light. Going back to one like the Son of Man, we'll show these uh, passages here we see three different aspects of who is and what will, what will become of this Son of Man. Matthew 9, 6, But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. So the Son of Man is linked with forgiving sins. And they have a complaint about that. They say, who but God has the power to forgive sins? Well, Son of Man does as well. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. <clears throat> Excuse me, Luke 9, 22, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders. So what are we talking about here? He is going to be persecuted. He is going to be brought before the elders and, tr and tried uh, for what he has said, what he has claimed to be, really. They understood what was going on. And be killed and be raised the third day. John 8, 28 says, Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, speaking of the crucifixion, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. <clears throat> From these passages we see He can forgive sins, He must suffer, and He will be lifted up, and He also will die and be raised the third day. Again, who are we talking about? And Daniel 7.13, I don't have this up here. I forgot to get it in there. But Daniel 7.13, Daniel has imagery of who he calls one like the Son of Man. And Daniel uh, is an apocalyptic book, if you will. It is closely related to Revelation, very closely. Some chapters uh, really are considered is basically Revelation Daniel part 2 though Daniel has nothing really to do with Revelation. Daniel 7.13 reads this way, I was searching the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man 
coming with the clouds of heaven. So Daniel is speaking of this return of Christ, but he calls him one like the Son of Man. We see that in Revelation, one like the Son of Man. Now there's lots of talk about why they use that particular phrase. In the Gospels, it says Son of Man. It doesn't say one like the Son of Man. Uh, my conjecture would be that Daniel had not experienced Jesus Christ on earth, so he is he knows who this Son of Man is by through these visions and as he's wrestling him. So he's looking for it, and he's saying one like the Son of Man, not really fully comprehending it. Uh, John is looking back after Christ has been crucified and raised from the grave, and he says one like the Son of Man because he knew him differently while he was on the earth. Now he's experiencing him in his glory. So he, I, I believe what they're saying is, He's the son of man, but really one like the son of man. There's a difference at this point. They could not recognize Jesus as they walked. They did not know who he was for a, for a time. He had to prove it to them who he was, even though they walked with him on the earth while he was before he was crucified. So that's my understanding, and it may be wrong. I don't know. I, I think there's lots of people that have different opinions. I don't know why it's... it's uh, Stated like that, one like the Son of Man, but that's my thought on that matter. It's inconsequential. That's a part of <clears throat> his name. We also find in Daniel more imagery, Daniel 7, 9 through 10, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. Who is this describing? The Ancient of Days. That's God the Father. That's God Yahweh. But we see the same descriptions of Jesus in Revelation 1. White as snow, hair like pure wool, in Daniel 10, 5 through 6, we have, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Ephaz. I don't know how to say that either. Euphaz, I've heard people say it different ways. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Powerful imagery. We see those things, same things that we just read them in our scripture reading today. If you need a quick reference, you can use your finger in the book of Revelation, or we have it right here. Read back through it and see what it says of Jesus, these same images in the Old Testament. Speaking of God, and we are finding out that Jesus here is in fact God. Revelation 2.18 says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God. Now we have another title. Son of God. Who is that? John wrote, The only begotten of the Father. So he's even more now. The Son of God. Who has eyes like a flame of fire. What did we just read in Daniel? And his feet like fine brass. There's a link here. We're tying directly to the Old Testament. We have in Ezekiel 43, 2, And behold the glory of the God of Israel, that's God proper, Yahweh, came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. So we have many, many proofs that we can go back through. We can look at every single one of these. Uh, I've looked at a lot of them, uh, and there's more. As you get go into the book of Revelation, there's more. It just keeps hitting. But let's skip to, I'm going to skip through some here. <clears throat> These last two verses, which is what this comes down to. We have this incredible image that John is witnessing. We have this uh, moment that John is forced to his knees with what he is witnessing. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Who is saying this? I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. He has power over Hades and death. He has, he has authority over the thing that 
sends us to Hades and death, the power over sin, because he died for our sins. He was the one who was dead and is now alive, but is also the first and the last. He's the one who, uh, that God created through, as we see in John, the word, the word became flesh, Jesus Christ. When God speaks, this is a conversation that Jamie and I had the other day, uh, and I had some verses to go through it, but book of Hebrews says the, the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword or two-edged sword that divides even bone and marrow and these things. When you think about, one, Jesus, the word, and John is logos, so oftentimes we, we call the word of God Jesus, but it is also the way God does things. When you go to Genesis, God did not have tools and materials that he kind of mixed together like my littlest does when she just takes everything, whatever she can grab from the house and starts building something and then makes a thing and says, look at this, this is great. And I say, yes, that's great. He speaks, let there be light, and it happens, right? So the, it's not just that Jesus is the word, but that power is final, is absolute. God spoke. Now relate that to the promises that he has given to those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, to shed blood on the cross, his death, burial, and his resurrection, that you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That is absolute. There's no questioning that because it is his word, the first and the last, the Almighty, who is greater than our sin, who is greater than anything you could do in your life, who John falls at the feet of, because it's just moved by what he is seeing. You can do that as well. Jesus has died for your sin. He is dead, but now is alive. Alive forevermore. There's no taking away that gift that he has given, because it is a forevermore promise, because he is alive forevermore. And I love this response that John has, <clears throat> but I love more the response that Jesus has to John falling. This is God of the universe. And he says, do not be afraid. I am he who lives and who is dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. So it, he, he's not approaching us to destroy us. He's approaching us to save us. He came to save the world. But another interesting point of this is later in Revelation and in other images, when these prophets get to see these things and they fall down before their feet, some of these people, they say, get up. Don't worship me. Who? What are you doing? We're, you're going to get us both in trouble, right? Jesus doesn't do that. He does not correct John, which is another subtle proof of who he is, at least who he's claiming. If in John, you give John credit that Jesus' words are actually Jesus' words, I am before Abraham. You also have to give Revelation credit because John is recording, apparently, what Jesus said to him, even though it's in a different capacity this time around. He is telling John, write these things. I am the first and the last. So Jesus is making a claim to deity here as well. And all of the imagery and everything that we have in here is to, at the one hand, make us fall on our feet because we're before a great and glorious and living God, but also to not stay there. I love you. I have given myself for you. Stand up. Do not be afraid of me. I have died for you. And my death and resurrection will be my glory forevermore. And it will be proof that I have paid for your sins and love you forevermore. Take it as absolute. When Jesus promises those things, the word of God is absolute. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word, that you reveal yourself in your word, that we can go back again and again and find something more that we did not see before and also grow deeper in what we know and be moved by the level of deepness that you have within you. We'll never reach the bottom, which is just beautiful and wonderful. May we try, though, uh, because that is where we find you, and that is where we see 
your love for us and your holiness and your glory. And we truly see your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his death, burial, and his resurrection, the promises given within him and by him, and the Holy Spirit that seals us with that promise. Remind us throughout the week these truths, who Jesus is, and may we be encouraged through all of the things that we are going through today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.